So welcome everyone to the April edition of the Let's Talk Business Models. Um, <clears throat> today we've got two guests with us to talk about membership models. We've got uh, Dale Doherty from uh, Make Community and Karim Jafarmada from Happy Lab Vienna. Um, a couple of announcements just as we get started. Um, so this talk is being done um, as part of the, the gig community talks. We have uh, Fadia on the line. Um, perhaps you could wave Fadia if anyone wants to talk, because we have people from the gig community and people from elsewhere. If anyone is interested in joining gig, please talk to Fadia. Um, these are also being done as part of the um, MAKE project, of which gig is one of the consortium members. And um, the link to the project website is in the chat now. Um, you can have a look at, uh, at the website. It says who all the other consortium members are. There's also a mailing list that you can sign up to if you're interested in that. Um, I wanted to <coughs> say a note about the schedule. So uh, this call is scheduled for 90 minutes. Um, we know that some people will need to leave after an hour and in particular, we're holding this later in the day today than we normally do. And uh, we know that um, in some parts of the world, uh, people are gonna need to drop off uh, as it gets to dusk um, for the iftar as, it, as we're in Ramadan. So we apologize for those of you who need to leave us a bit early, um, but, but thanks so much for joining while you can. Um, finally, the, this is part of a monthly series of, um, of talks. We will be having the next episode in May on the third Wednesday of the month, as usual, and the next topic, so that's going to be the 17th of May, and the topic we've selected for then is, is edutainment um, and how makerspaces can be um, creating revenue out of um, bringing the public in, in into makerspaces in a way that is uh, can engage people who didn't really think they were part of the, the maker movement. So we'll uh, be sharing more details about that in the next couple of weeks. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to now ask each of our speakers in turn to introduce themselves. And Dale, perhaps if we could start with you. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, I'm Dale Doherty. Um, to make community as it says on the screen but uh you know i started make magazine in 2005 and produced the first maker fair in 2006 and and uh um you know based on kind of an idea that there there were people out there that i you know called the makers initially that um you know like to build things create things uh and that making was kind of taking an idea that's in your head and making it real somehow physical somehow ability to share it with other people and that you know that there's a community and a, really a community of communities uh, of people that that do this and how could we bring them together connect to them and find out more what they do um <clears throat> so my my background really is in publishing and events and um you know um you know, uh, we've we've gone you know gone through a lot uh, of different times through through COVID and things, but um, uh, you know, this year there'll probably be uh, eighty or more maker fairs um, in in the world. But before COVID, we had about two hundred a year, um, so it's it's slowly starting to come back. But I, I think um, you know it's a it's an interesting time. Uh, uh, you know, we're not necessarily post COVID, but we're approaching it somewhat is um you know how, how to how spaces uh in schools um come back and and community spaces i've I spent a lot of time i'm also um head of maker ed um uh, uh it's a nonprofit that uh, really looks at how do we spread maker education uh through schools libraries and other organizations how do we get more kids the opportunity to make things so um uh is that sufficient as an intro Anna? yeah that's great thank you very much okay. Dale. um so karim if i could pass over to you and ask you to introduce yourself and happy lab please <clears throat> yeah sure thank you uh for the invitation uh, i'm karim i'm one of the founders of happy lab 
And um, basically, we've been doing this also since a long time. Um, we started Happy Lab in 2006 um, here in Vienna, in Austria. Uh, and basically, at the first, uh, at first, it was just me and a few friends who we had our own projects, robotics projects, and we needed a space for ourselves, like many do. And from almost 20 years ago, there were not so many spaces. Even the term maker space was not really existing. So we rented a cellar somewhere and uh, gathered for our robotics projects. And from the beginning, we were amazed how many other people artists, other engineers, but like normal common people were interested in also joining and, and using the same machines that we used for our robotics projects for something completely different, something that we couldn't even imagine what it is. And so um, we opened our, our space. Uh, and as the topic is membership models from the beginning, we, we were uh, using a, a kind of a membership model uh, for for running that uh, we we were like bottom up initiative. We had no no big organization behind us, so so the, the the need was there to get some some income to cover our costs, and it it worked. It, we we grew uh, very fast. Uh, after a few years, we had over one thousand members. Uh, we also opened other spaces in in Salzburg, in Austria, and also in Berlin uh, with the same model and. Um, on the way, we also developed a system for managing uh, such a space with a with, uh, with business model. Uh, it's called Fabman. This is a, a web-based uh, platform where you can, can manage your members, automatic bookings, uh, billings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this is a spin-off now from Happy Lab. We also sell that to other spaces. We have around 100, uh, 120 uh users all around the world like other maker spaces that use that uh for running their lab and we think that it helps a lot my background is in in uh, computer science so i like to automate stuff and it helps a lot to get this boring stuff automated so that uh, people can can be together can can do the cool stuff can talk and can cooperate in the space uh, but don't have to worry about the uh, billing and the boring boring things so this is kind of where we are. We are still here in Vienna. We have a, around 1,000 square meters. I think it's 10,000 square foot. Um, and uh, a space here with everything from a wood workshop, metal workshop, etc. So of course, we, we are happy to, to visit us here anytime. And um, yeah, I think this is, this is the short introduction. That's great. And thank you very much for the invitation to visit you there in, in Vienna as well, Karim. That's um, that's wonderful. Um, could you just say a little bit about um, the, the the way that membership works for you now? Um, I'm sure it's and, and also whether that has evolved over the years since you started. Like, do you have different um, different kind of tiers, different categories, anything like that? Mm -hmm. You could just talk a little bit about um, that yeah um sure we uh the way we operate our maker spaces yeah we have a we have a membership with different tiers um and it's kind of a, a mixed model so um you have your membership and you have some free minutes credits however you want to call it coins included for machine usage as well because as we grew and got more and more machines we we noticed that um in the beginning everything was a flat rate and you could use as much as you want but then we have uh, and you have your kind of a fair use policy, but not not written down. But it's kind of uh, I don't know. Surround everyone thinks it's it's something everyone knows. But uh, you soon have people not like uh, doing their their business, which is cool. We always encourage people to do their business, but people who who use the space more, in our opinion, should also like pay their fair share for for the usage. So the way we do it now, or we solve this problem, is that you have some included credits which is enough for most of the casual users. Uh, and if you use more, like if you laser 24 seven or whatever, um, have a bigger project, then you have to pay for the additional costs. It's similar as in, at least in Europe, the cell phone contracts work where you have some free included gigabytes of data and minutes for, for, for talking. And if you exceed that limit, you have to pay additional fees. And uh, so this is like the basic model. And then in the different tiers, you have more or less included credits, basically. This is how we, uh, so you have your starter membership, um, which in our case is very cheap. 
um, and like you can start with that, have make small projects, but then as you grow also as a maker or if you business oriented as you grow your business uh you go to a bigger tier where you have more included uh credits and and can can make bigger projects uh with that so this is basically uh how we work um we do not distinguish between because i know many do that we do not distinguish between private memberships and business memberships we had that also we tried many different things uh, we didn't like that at all because people didn't tell us anymore what they do because we they thought they can have the cheaper membership if they don't tell us that they're a business and then you have all those people doing the really cool projects and don't tell you about that because they fear they have to pay more uh, and we said we don't want that. Also, the boundary is often not clear when does something start to become a business and when it's still a hobby. So, so we said uh, we just make a, a flat fee for everyone um yeah this is uh one of the outcomes we had through the years that's really interesting thank you for sharing that um dale if i could come back to you and ask you to just talk a little bit about the, the sort of the subscriptions and memberships and how that works for make and um I'd be particularly interested in in learning sort of how that has evolved and and any of the lessons that you've learned over the years from that thank you yeah, <clears throat> sure. Yeah, so I'm not coming at it from a space model uh, necessarily, but you know, it's a, the basic ideas. You know, what's a business model for a magazine? At least as I started, then what was the business model for Maker Fair? Um, you know, at the time I started, make a lot of magazines uh, were were ad supported, uh, meaning most of they they got a small amount of money from subscribers but they the bulk of the money came from advertisers and um i didn't think there was much of an advertising market for make magazines so i i couldn't go with that model <clears throat> and i i needed to have subscribers um and they needed to pay more than um typically they might pay you know maybe for an ad supported magazine, I'm just making up some numbers, but like $10, you know, I needed them to pay 30 to $35. <clears throat> and because we didn't have ad advertising and it, you know, and it, and it basically worked <coughs> uh, to get us going. Um, and that that's continued to be important part of what, you know, enables us to do it is to have subscribers that are willing to pay for getting a magazine. Um, and similarly with Maker Faire, uh, um, you know, maybe, you know, when, when we first started it, I, I didn't know if we could get sponsorship. We ended up getting some for a while, but it's, uh, um, it's not always predictable. Um, and so we, you know, sold tickets and some people say, well, why don't you make it a free event? And some Maker Fairs are free, um, because they get sponsors to put it on, but, um, we also kind of felt it was important for people to pay for something and they value it um, in, in, in that way. So it's, it's at least, you know, being fairly transparent. So, um, you know, and I'd say, you know, it's kind of the, whether you're a nonprofit or for-profit, it's kind of the same, same challenge is like who pays for it. And the, and the problem a little bit with sponsorship as it is with a, a nonprofit is you have to spend a lot of time going out and getting money to pay for your ability to serve a group of people. Now, if you can find, you know, corporations or others, foundations or things that want to serve that, you know, want you to serve that people, that's great. But sometimes there's a big mismatch in what they want you to do and what you want to do. And so, you know, getting people to pay directly for the services they provide is you know gives you the ability to be pretty responsive to the, the you know really your customer um you know uh make used to be called maker media it had some investment and other things and kind of that sort of failed in 2019 and and i took it over um solely in 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 that time and uh you know i've been trying to build a um a little bit um kind of an association model for make that that we have members you know who include subscribers but um 
uh, you know, for us to be able to do what we do and serve the community, um, we ask people to become members. Um, now to give some numbers, I mean, it's probably not that significant, but it's, uh, you know, uh, subscribers, we have about 40,000 subscribers and that's, that's a pretty good number, but, you know, trying to get membership um, in association with that is about 2000 uh, members or, or a little bit more than that. But, um, you know, I, I s still feel that's kind of important. I mean, if, if we value this, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, asking people to become members and to um, uh, join us really in in how we, you know, what we're able to do. So to both to promote making and, and makers, um, but also to put, you know, cre uh, create events and, and produce, you know, information that's useful to makers and in the community. Um, you know, one thing I, I will say that I, I've followed certainly maker spaces all along and Fab Labs and others. And, you know, the, they're really, some of the origins are kind of interesting because the Fab Labs tended to be, you know, have more like institutional support, like a university or something gets funds to run a Fab Lab. And then, <laughs> and I'm making a generalization here, but then they go out and try to find a community for that you know, Fab Lab. And, uh, you know, what I always found interesting about the self-started maker spaces and, and such was they often started with a community. They didn't have much of a budget or resources externally, and um, they, they grow at their own rate and they serve that community. Um, and so they start, you know, with people that care about it. Uh, and want it to be something. I, I've looked over the years. I, I've been fascinated by cooperatives, um, and and I've I've wondered if there's a level of support where you could, you know, membership of a maker space is one thing, but you know, in early places like Tech Shop looked at, uh, you know, like like a gym model where where you pay a monthly fee. But it's kind of the trouble with that in a way is, is that people come in and out pretty easily they could join for a month to do a project and then then leave and so you have these you know gyms typically you know get a lot of people in in january at the beginning of the year and they lose them by april right so how do you get a more permanent sense of that and that's why it's interesting co-ops that there's a history there of cooperative associations uh, in effect that um there's a sense of ownership in that group they're kind of somewhere in between for profit and non-profit I haven't really found a makerspace doing that yet. I mean, I think there's parts of it and there's, there's at least in the US and I think in, in other parts of Europe, uh, there's, there's uh, a set of laws around co-ops, how they, how they run. Sometimes they can be overly bureaucratic, but um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting uh, to, uh, to say how, how do, um, how do a group of people sustain something? You know, that one of the troubles that nonprofit in some ways is nobody owns it. You know, the board uh, owns that. And, you know, you get a different board or you get different sponsors in and out, whatever. Um, and and uh, what's going on here? Um, and so, uh, you know, we have, have, have uh, you know, different situations to address. But I, I think, you know, the, the basic line is who pays for things and what are the consequences of that. And, you know, um, you know, we've seen on a business side, you know, advertising revenue for publishing is way low. You know, the, the Googles and Facebooks have taken that away. So you really have to kind of get people to support it if they appreciate it. And if they, would, they don't, you go away. Thanks so much for that, Dale. Um, just a, a quick clarification question for my understanding. Um, among the members that, and subscribers that you have, or, or well, the members specifically, mm -hmm. is that individuals or organizations typically, or is it a mixture? It's individuals. Okay. Um, uh, we might have the option of organizations, but we don't. We may have gotten only one over time. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 harder serving organizational needs you know like if you were a lobbying organization or some other things maybe that will align with you know their needs a bit but it's it's, it's difficult to serve organizations 
Hi, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, Karim, if I could um, ask you to come in in just a moment on the point that Dale raised that I thought was really interesting about ownership and, you know, membership being a way to get people who are really committed to the success of a, um, a, a thing to contribute to that and feel a sense of ownership towards it. Um, so I'm going to ask you to come in on that in just a moment, uh, but I just firstly wanted to give a warning that I'd like to also open this up to um, to discussion. And so um, please have a think about what, what questions people have. Um, there's already some comments starting in the chat. Um, and, you know, I'm also really interested to hear experiences from anyone, any of the participants about um, membership models. So Karim, if we could just come to you on the, the topic of ownership for a moment, please. Yeah, I think this, this, is, this is very true. Um, and I, I also think it, uh, a membership model is a good fit for a makerspace, in my opinion, because for both sides, uh, as a like makerspace manager or maker or like owner, you also invest a lot in, in in the new members. They need to be trained. They need to like try things out. So at first, at first, um, and of course you can you can. They, maybe some models where they pay for the workshops, but but that can also be so much. So so it's always like you invest a lot of in these new people, and but they also need to learn something. So so to bind them a little bit to the space, uh, so that they, they stay longer, uh, is is I think very important. We often have people asking that, but they just need to do this one thing, and can they just come and and laser cut this one piece, and and actually, um, we. We don't think this really makes sense because I mean, okay, you can do that as an as a as a service for someone. There are lots of companies doing that. There are also lots of makerspaces that have, have that as a side service. Uh, but to have someone come in and and show them how to use the machine for just this one time, uh, I don't think this makes much sense. And this is also not not why a makerspace exists. So uh, we want to educate the people to to do things that for themselves, to repair things, do it yourself, do it together, things like that. And this also only makes sense if they like feel kind of connected to the space. And even th even though we are uh, kind of officially a for-profit organization running the space, um, and so our members are more or less basically just the customers. But I still have this feeling that they are that they are more connected than just uh, when you go buy somewhere in the shop. It's kind of uh, and this is for sure through this membership model. Of course, you have the problems with, uh, with, with the gym system that uh, people go on and off and want to uh, only pay for the time that they really use the space. Um, but yeah, you can try to at least automate again lots of stuff here so that you don't have work with that at least and have some incentives that they still stay at, at the space. So for example, during COVID, um, we had to also for some months close our space, like probably most of parts of the world. And uh, I'm very glad that we have this membership model because most of our members just kept paying us um, because they saw the need they, that they kind of, uh, that of course we still need to pay rent and have all our costs. Um, and it's also like a very resilient model, I think, if, if you have kind of your community, your members, taking care of these 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 shared costs um yeah i mean of course there are other models how to run a makerspace but they are mostly than just you have your big sponsor or governmental organization or big company and then you are always uh dependent on what they decide and whether they still want to support you or not um so yeah in our case like a big part of our revenue is from these memberships and and uh, like I said, in, in such situations, unclear situations like like COVID, this was was I think very very good for us. Yeah, if I might jump in, I think you make an interesting point too. Is I think to really execute a membership model well is you kind of need an organization that you know I, I'd argue it's hard to do that on a volunteer basis. Like I see some spaces that you know it's just uh, like i call them a club you know that like we have a dozen people that want to have access to a maker space and it's kind of stays at a dozen <laughs> you know it, it it uh you know but some degree of professionalization is required so that you're recruiting members 
you give them, you consider what their experience is like when they walk in, how do they get trained? Um, I've always felt it's sort of true that a lot of people are interested in maker spaces and there's maybe a percentage of people like 25% that show up with a clear idea of what they want to do. But the others, you know, it's kind of like the gym model is like, well, I don't know how to use the equipment in the gym and I'm not a, you know, trained to do that and I don't have any goals associated, but I should be here, you know? So I, I, I kind of felt like the, the key person is, is like a person at a, at a front desk, mm -hmm. you know, that says, hello, checks them in, you know, says, what do you need? Can I help you with anything? And some spaces, well, most spaces at this point have that, but it took a while to get there. You know, and that's part of what you're funding. Yeah, this is this is one thing. I think we started with that very early, and like like you said, many do that now. We always had some like opening hours where you're welcome, where you just can drop by. I mean, you have, for example, at, at the makerspace, you have kind of big audience, many people that get interested to do stuff, and then often the problem is how can they get really in touch with 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 the with a space where they can really also try things out themselves and um yeah you need some welcoming parts where they can uh easily see like we always say people need to come once to our space to really like they get a free tour for example and they can like get a feeling it's it's one thing to describe something to someone or they read it on the home page then you you get these 20 percent that that already know what they want to do and they basically just need somewhere where the machines they already know uh, are located. But the much bigger crowd is this, this other 80% that uh, also might have ideas, uh, but, but they need some more like guidance to, to, get, to get started. Um, I think this is a, a big point. Mm, yeah, and there's a comment in the chat um, from Saad of Edinburgh Makerspace in Singapore saying a front desk really goes a long way to onboarding new people. Um, right. Saad, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add to that. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I really like the distinction there. Um, with uh, the clubhouse model, um, it, it, it uh, like what Dale said, it tends to be, you know, the few people that started the thing to share the space and the tools, but it never really grows beyond that. And um, thinking about what the experience is for new people, that's something that tends to get overlooked a lot. And we learned that the hard way with it for Makerspace. Um, but yeah, having, so uh, what, we, what works for us is that we set aside uh, a time uh, once a week that is open for everybody. It's kind of like an open house. And uh, because we can't afford to have a front desk person um, every single day, that uh, regularity, that frequency of having an open house uh, on every Saturday between nine and five, uh, that really helped bring people in because uh, they don't feel like uh, if they don't get everything done on that one day that they happen to walk into the space, uh, they wouldn't be able to do it ever again. So uh, it's always available the next weekend. So they just come back. Yeah, you know, I will add that, you know, there's kind of a category of makerspace in uh, the, the, that's increasingly in universities and community colleges and you know probably high schools and other places uh, you know that it's not a membership model it's really paid for out of the school budget and and uh you know they operate a little differently they they may actually have students become members usually because they want them to be trained and uh, other aspects, you know, safety training and things, but um, the funding is very different there. And they kind of have a, well, their, their users are, you know, in the campus, right? They're, they're, they're uh, 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 available there. So the recruitment is, is, is a different thing. But I think largely what we're talking about here is independent spaces, um, community spaces uh, that, that really don't have that kind of, granddaddy or whatever to, to pay for things. I'd love to try and bring in an alternative perspective because um, I very much agree with, with 
what you said, Kareem, earlier about it being quite a natural fit um, for a makerspace um, to have members and to you know have the community supporting it in that way. But I also know that in some places, um, makerspaces are wanting to work with communities that have very little, if any, disposable income. Um, and, you know, so there can be a challenge in creating impact for the people you want to work with if you were to require them to pay. Um, and I've had conversations with some of the people on this call um, in the past about things like this. I'm wondering if um, Omar or Martin um, is available to, to jump in and just, just talk a little bit about um, challenges of getting um, getting members to pay I neither of them are able to jump in at the moment, I think. Um, okay. Oh, yes. hi there, Martin. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Please. I'm here. Yes, um, actually, I'm running a Fab Lab, and uh, some of the challenges that um, we normally get, uh, especially, um, I don't think, I don't know if this is very common in African Fab Labs, but a lot of people are not very keen in making payment, probably because of um, they lack money, but they have pro projects. And you see, if you are sitting there, especially as Fab Lab or a makerspace, you are actually at the bottom um, of, 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 a, of, a, of a startup. That is where an idea comes and then you, you bring it to life. And then that is when probably they'll be able to get funders later on or somebody to invest in. So at that level, most of them tend not to have income. And so at times it forces you to come to agreement with them that can you can you work, work on it and on part payment and something like that. So getting members to pay membership, uh, many times it's, it's a challenge. And so at times we just get them to free membership just to make sure that they can use the space but then you only charge on the the usage thanks yeah, martin um and noella um can i call on you i see you've put a comment in the chat about that being the reality in cameroon as well yes and sure hi um, I agree with Martin, and um, I, I have a question now um, on how, um, based on what everybody's sharing and the kind of membership models and the payment um, plan where people pay as per what they use. We have this issue with makerspaces and other production labs. Like, um, I, if I'm coming to a makerspace with a project, for example, it, it, it means that I have to probably learn how to use these things. But whereas I can just go to a production place and just get it done there. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to pay and get it done and take it out. So I don't know if um, um, the, the speakers have um, some experience in, in this kind of areas. And how do they reinforce the sense of community, of um, creativity and um, uh, independence in, in making things in, in their spaces? Harim, is that something you could comment on? Um, I mean, I can, I can try. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm thinking about is um, in our country, labor cost is, is, is very high. So, and, and this is why people want to do it themselves in their makerspaces because they don't have to pay someone to do the work. I mean, they still might have to pay the little fee for the, for the machine. Uh, but if you, if you let it, uh, let someone else do, do the work for you, then it's, it's, it's much bigger part than this, this, uh, smaller machine usage part. So this is like in at least in in, in Europe and probably also in the US the, the biggest like uh, reason why someone might like fin financially might decide to do it themselves. And there are lots of other good reasons why to do it yourself might be better in, in product development because you're much uh, closer to the to the prototyping and you you see the 
you, you might see some errors already that you can that you can work around or have new ideas so there are more reasons of course but just financially talking um, this is how we uh, how we approach this I mean we also since since a year or two offer uh, offer services and then of course if someone wants a prototype done for example there are these two options if, if the service is too expensive they still can become a member and many do that uh, and we are mainly still a makerspace but we we've seen in the past some mostly startups uh, might not have the the might have some funding but do not have the resources to do it themselves so then then we jump in and mm -hmm. we have experts doing that uh, but that's of for sure much more expensive than than the way uh, but also like faster than than the, than the other way so this is kind of how we how, how i see that and of course, also uh, uh, to to Martin, um, I also like at some Fab conference a few years ago. I also talked to some people from Africa and India, and for sure, um, there are, there are other other problems there. Um, people getting people to pay for the membership, but even in 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 our country, there might be people that that cannot afford the membership and and might have a nice project, but still are waiting funding or something like that. And we often work together with funding agencies or business incubators or things like that. Uh, so they can get like, uh, they pay for the membership of these of these uh, startups or of these companies. So they, this might be also a model if you're still like working on a membership base, uh, but then have other people pay for, for, the, for the membership fees of the, of the actual makers, it might, might be something. Think yeah. about. Do you know, I, my thought is that that's kind of one of the reasons I brought up the educational um, maker spaces that, you know, like, I guess one of the better ways of serving people that can't afford that is to associate it with an educational institution as many fab labs are. And, you know, uh, <laughs> but they sometimes have a conflict that, that people don't want to be students in the university. Um, and are, 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 so they sometimes don't get people from a neighborhood to come in and use the fab lab because they feel like they're not part of the university so there's all these complexities but you know you kind of have to come up with this is an educational mission where we're helping people you know learn and train how to you know to do things and it's you know you have to find sponsors for that you know, that will pay for some number of students. Um, you know, the, and uh, in America, we see a little bit uh, in things like workforce development, um, where, you know, some government agencies are willing to, um, they call it upskilling, they invest in people who, sometimes it's not so much, you know, the, the um, it, it's like running a program out of the makerspace to upskill people. Right. And it's not so much giving them just access to the space for a project. So I think that's those are some of the directions where, like, you think of it, it's sometimes hard to get an, uh, an organization to pay for the makerspace, but they may pay for the program in a makerspace. Mm -hmm. And I think educational, I don't think makerspace have done enough to come up with educational programs, um, which could be for kids, could be for adults, whatever it is. Uh, and um you know uh and who pays for that um sometimes uh you can get funders for that and that wouldn't you know understand you know underwriting memberships in a makerspace for instance um the other thing i want to mention was there's i think dreams kind of touched on it a little bit but i see um uh you know that we um uh, you see professional maker spaces, what I call them. In, in other words, these are, uh, there's when I, I visited a, a piece on and called it Inventopia in Davis, California. And it's really intended for people with startups um, coming out of the university and kind of incubating a project. And they don't really want a lot of other makers or other people around. It's the same equipment, same space, but they're, they kind of have a small base inside of it, um, uh, you know, and they run their business, uh, the startup business out of there. Uh, but uh, it's usually not a public maker space. And, you know, they're, they're, they're getting grant funding or whatever to start their business. Um, but it's an, 
um, and, and, and which leads to another point that one, I don't know if Kareem, you do this, but some spaces have, uh, I always think the artisan's asylum model, but um, they provide space to rent um, uh, as opposed to a membership, just a membership model is like, oh, I get this, you know, 10 by 10 cube for my artisan work or other things. And, uh, and that, that, that's given them stability in, um, in, in people renting for six months or a year, as opposed to coming in and just doing a project, you know, and they get to, you know, organize that space, leave equipment or projects out. Yeah, this is this is a good point. We we I mean we we are in the city, so we don't have these huge uh, places, but we do have desks that you can that you can rent. But not like you can also individual rent them. But what works good for us is uh, we set up a residency program. Uh, so again, like like someone else pays for the residency program, and then we uh, uh, interesting projects. We often have calls in different directions. So sometimes design or uh, you know circular economy things like that, and they they apply to us, and we can then select a few, and they can have this space here in our in our uh, space and uh, work here uh, six months on their project, develop it together with us with help from our people uh, when they need some prototyping uh, or something like that. But mainly work on their own, but use the machines and the equipment they have here and the community uh, to to involve their idea. And this has, it has been very successful also for us to attract new people, to get interesting projects going on. Um, and also that's, that's good good for, for outreach afterwards, because you have those nice, nice projects. Um, this is something we've been doing the, uh, since a year or two now. Some years back when I was, um, so I was one of the co-founders of Kamasi Hive. And when I was involved in that in the early days, um, the space rental model is one that we used a bit um, that we could rent out office space um, and have a differential pricing um, structure for local organizations versus international organizations. Um, and we were able to use that um, a little bit to subsidize some of the kind of free community membership um, of people not based there permanently but just coming in to use the maker space um yeah i'm really interested um to hear to hear other comments um about this um just there's a question i think question from in there yeah oh yeah sorry i yeah. wasn't uh this yeah there's a question uh, also do you want me to read it just yeah yeah just, great go well, ahead just yeah jesse martin asked and I, I think Karim, you probably are more in this, how much investment goes into the membership business model? What values do you need to give other than time, than machine usage and trainings? I just, I'm just, I uh, hear. Um, yeah, from Martin Olu. Um, yeah, well, um, this is interesting. Good, good question. Um, we we try. You mentioned the trainings is probably one of the biggest biggest thing, um, because um, we have some free trainings and we have a lot of trainings. Even that cost, some, they are not sold at cost. Uh, our trainings basically because their trainings are more or less a way to get the people in and to get them started and to uh, get them interested in the machines. Um, uh, so uh, basically, this is what we invest on in each member, uh, the number of trainings. We need to do safety trainings with them because some of our of, of some of the equipment is also dangerous to people. Um, so this is uh, this is for sure something uh, something to consider. And something you also need to consider somehow is people also make mistakes and things break all the time. So my my lab managers here, I don't know, more, more than 50% of their time, they're just fixing stuff that broke. Um, and you normally cannot uh, charge all our people those those uh, those uh, costs. Um, and you might get some insurance here or there for some things, but but also like these, these uh, this is something you often forget that people, the machines. Um, 
even if you buy very high quality machines, um, they're used in the space by not professional users that, that are not doing this uh, the whole day. So um, naturally things break because some small mistakes happen. And uh, most of that cost is basically on us. We try to charge some small fee or if some uh, uh, like, if you need some buy some materials, you might be able to charge that, but you cannot charge the full thing on, on your on your model. Also, um, if, uh, if I Karim, would do that, I, it would be he, too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Kareem, I think one of the things it might be asking a little bit is to some degree software to manage membership. Um, uh, or I mean, it could be a spreadsheet, but increase. You talked earlier about how you you have a system for doing that, so. Um, I, I've seen different places, but they, you know, you have to keep track of, you know, when when they join, when they've paid, when they, they're overdue, you know, when they come in, are they a member or not? All, all that kind of thing is 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 a kind of investment in software, at least. Yeah. Yes. Um, we uh, I mentioned this in in, in the beginning. Uh, we developed a system for that, um, which which is also a subscription-based model. So we like the membership model everywhere, also with our software. Um, because again, if you're starting a membership mem makerspace, uh, you don't pro probably have uh, the, the money to pay someone to build the software for you and uh, or to, to uh, invest there a lot. Uh, so yes, but this is a, this is a big part um, and. With, uh, with a spreadsheet, I mean, you can start, you can manage maybe 20, 40, 50 people, but at some point, uh, the, the, this doesn't work anymore. You don't know ev everyone anymore. Uh, there are all these safety issues. You, make, you need to make sure um, that probably for some machines that only the trained people are allowed to use them. Um, and if you don't know anyone, everyone anymore, uh, you cannot check that. Uh, without the automatic system, um, if, even if they automatically pay with you by I don't know credit card, sometimes the, the this doesn't go through, and you need a way to uh, send them the invoices again and to uh, to get your money at the end of the day. Um, so yes, I I would I think something something that is needed for sure, and I think our our solution Fabman is is one of the easiest. Uh, uh, on the market uh, that, that helps here. And this is exactly for makerspaces. There are lots of systems for co-working spaces, but um, um, they have different problems, other kind of problems. Um, and the makerspace market is very, sl uh, very small. Um, and so there is not, not so much going on and not, not many big companies are focusing on the makerspaces. Um, Yeah, that, that definitely rings true. Um, there's a question also from Dawson, um, Dawson Sumange. I don't know if you're able to um, unmute and, and ask that yourself. Yeah, uh, okay. It was not like a question, but it was appreciation uh, to Dare. He was trying to explain the concept of how we can overcome the challenges especially on the issue of, um, uh, he was trying to explain the issue of, um, uh, I mean, yeah, the cool concept, how to learn and uh, get through the challenges. Yeah, because they are from Tanzania and uh, we are trying to organize ourselves so that we, we enter on the system of makerspace. And uh, now even tomorrow, I mean, tomorrow, we, we will be having an event with AdSense, yeah. Familiarizing them with the whole concept of Fab Lab. Yeah, so we was also assuming the same because uh, as uh, Karim was trying to explain, there are a lot of challenges we have noted, but us, because we are new, we, are, we want now to see how we can organize these artisans, bring them in as a, in a Fab Lab as a Fab Network. Uh, but also we would like to see, there are some artisans who don't have tools but there are others with the tools. So we want to see, okay, if we have this part or makerspace, how it will be helpful even to others and make people uh, of these artists get connected now. Yeah, so that's why I was appreciating that the concept of the explanation from that was bringing me a hope that, oh, 
so we can manage now. Yeah. So it was like appreciation, not a question. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for misunderstanding, but thank you very much for for expressing that. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. Thank you. If if other people have um, have comments or questions, please feel free to yeah. um, put your hand up or or type I, them in I the chat. And as uh, Saad asked, would having maker spaces and community college environments be a good idea? Have you come across examples of this? Yes. Um, in California, there was a program to put uh, maker spaces in community colleges, um, our government program. And, and I think I was an advisor to that program. And we got 24 spaces uh, in, that, in that time. And many of them have outlived uh, the program. On, on the maker ed site, um, you, you can find a newsletter I'm writing there, and I, I profiled the Sacramento City College uh, makerspace, which just kind of moved to a new building and expanded its services and offerings. So, uh, but I think it's a wonderful example of reaching students who probably, you know, from the maker movement's point of view, reaching students who don't know a lot about making, um, often uh, uh, don't have any experience with projects, let alone the technology um, in a makerspace. And, uh, you know, what I found there was <laughs> that, that they actually formed a really nice supportive community there. So, you know, a lot of uh, people at a college are, their experience is just classes. You know, I signed up for a class and this is more like a club or walking in and people say, hey, how you doing? And what do you want to do? And do you know about this or that? And so it's very welcoming. And I, I think it has a lot of potential for students who really are in college, but don't know why they're in college or don't know what they want to do and, and give them a time to experiment and, you know, acquire uh, like techno technological or creative skills. So I think it's a, a great idea. I'd love to see examples of this outside the United States um, as well. I'm just trying to remember the name of it. It escapes me at the moment. But um, in Ghana, there is a um, a fab lab that was set up very, very early in the um, in the history of fab labs. I think it was the, the first one outside the US. Yeah. Actually, um, was attached to a um, a kind of TVET college, a, a technical vocational um, college. So, sort of somewhat similar. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's a really interesting model, but I do think you need to have um i mean as with as with all of these you need to have the right champions and you need to have you know you need to build the community when you've got the when you set up with an institution otherwise it can be hard to to maintain those yeah yeah so was there something else you wanted to raise on that sorry i'm not being very good at keeping up on the chat <laughs> as well <laughs> No, it, it, I appreciate what uh, Dale has shared, and I was just looking in and uh, to the maker ed thing, and it's 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 beautiful. It's it. I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, because I'm trying something out here in Singapore uh, with the libraries, the public libraries, and uh, Singapore has uh, it's got some pretty shiny libraries, but there are four uh, branches are scattered around the island country where um there are maker spaces and they have been for quite a few years now uh, and a lot of local singaporeans don't know that there has been they have had access to 3d printing for free for a very long time um in spite of the library doing its best efforts of like you know doing outreach and trying to get people to come in and learn about 3d printing um the uptake has been quite low uh so we're trying something new to make it meaningful and the new library uh, is designed for accessibility and inclusion uh, it's wheelchair accessible and it's got a lot of accessibility features in it um, so the makerspace i'm trying to uh, do and um, focus on assistive devices or uh, making or 3d printing for 3d printing for persons with disabilities um, so we just got started on this i don't know how much how this will um progress but all of the the things that are being discussed right now are uh very much 
going to play, have a part to play in how this plays out. I mean, we're trying to get people to come in and do something meaningful with the skills that they gain and not just, you know, do one course and then disappear. Uh, it's like, okay, I made a little, you know, keychain. I know how to 3D print. I'm great. Uh, what do you do with that um, is the question that keeps getting asked in some uh, of these makerspaces. So we're trying it out. And I think the community college model um, will be helpful yeah. to look at. So I'm going to look yeah. at all of those as well as I can find. Yeah, libraries are a great place. You know, it kind of, I think the challenge, I mean, and I, I think you can look to countries in Europe and, and the United States for this. Um, and, and again, um, you know, we started with none of this and, you know, we have something and to some degree we've lost some of this and we have, you know, it comes back in other ways. So it's not like just a progression of, you know, growth. Um, but, you know, ultimately we're trying to build the ecosystem here of, for makers and, you know, it would be great, you know, to have the library offer something and have the community college offer something to have community maker spaces and fab labs and they complement each other. Um, you know, early days, there was a little bit of comp competitiveness between spaces. Uh, oh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're this space and not that space. And, and I think over time, um, you know, we want communities with lots of different kinds of spaces serving different, different people and different needs. And they might, you know, a library makerspace, for instance, might not have a lot of advanced equipment beyond 3D printing. It may not be able to have like, you know, woodworking and other equipment in it. But, you know, if, if, if people can get access to some kinds of making, some kinds of even kits and things, that's a, that's a really great starter set for them. And uh, they can find other places in the community to, to do, um, you know, to have. Uh, um, and I think that's a, one thing that's changed and instead of like having one fab lab in the community, you know, we really need to think of a network of spaces that serve different, you know, people and purposes. I think that's such a great point, Dale. I think it really is an ecosystem that we're trying to build. Um, and yeah. I think that also speaks to um, what Karim mentioned earlier about um, giving people a choice of whether they want to learn the skills and do the making themselves or whether they want to, um, you know, pay for a service and have something made yeah. for them. I mean, you know, whether those things are offered in the same space or by different spaces, to me, they should all be part of the ecosystem um, for these Invisible. kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Um, Saad, I just wanted to mention on the libraries um, that there was some really interesting work done in Belgium, I think, um, that got some... I believe state funding to roll out um, makerspaces in libraries pretty much across the country or certainly across a region. And uh, there's a space called in Ingenio, Ingenio um, who were very involved in that. Um, that might be inter an interesting model for you to look at as well. I'll just put the name in the chat because I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. It was something like that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm going to look this up as well I think I just found them or it I'll might have link. yeah great thank you any other questions thoughts comments people with experience to share hello this is Fernando from Buenos Aires here nice to meet you nice to hear all your sayings big fan of dale know him for a long for a long time i'm a frustrated uh, makerspace founder myself along with some uh, partners in 2013 we we tried to start up a makerspace in buenos aires called neti not everything is inventive and it was quite of a ride and uh, we we just didn't could we couldn't do it. We we tried we 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 in, we tried to fund investment. We we built up a community first of all with some uh, pop up events, and um, 
it was quite an experience that the, the model mutated into something else, pivoted into um, innovation, design, assessment, because that didn't need a space, that didn't need uh, a fa a, a machines, that didn't need so much personnel, and ended up being something more of, of the spirit of the Fab Lab without the Fab thing. And uh, was quite interesting. Now, um, what I do is called Alchemetricos. I, this is an open science, uh, open STEAM toys kit, uh, which is uh, a project I, I have started eight years ago. And uh, it started as part of the result of being, trying to put up a, a, a maker space and, I see as as Archimedical who was born in a makerspace, I feel that I have a factory in each makerspace in the world where I can arrive with a pen drive and get out with a full kit. Uh, of, we have already done that. Uh, makerspaces and fab labs are like uh, 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 like an incubator for us. Each time we find, we find one, we know we have everything we need to replicate our model. So the question is, do you know of any functional act actually working um, distributed manufacturing model that you can recommend, that you can, that you know of, that you can uh, like a producer or a, or a startup that designs products that can uh, think of a global platform or a, or a rational platform to use to have each fab lab, each each digital fabrication place to work as a factory. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I understand your question, and I appreciate it, Fernando. Um, let me just, you know, I don't think there's lots of good examples. However, during COVID, I think the best example we saw, you know, globally is how things like face masks. Um, originated from one or two designs that were spread around the world and people made them locally with the equipment in makerspaces. Now, I hope personally that our governments would look at that and say, what an amazing capacity. We need to invest in that capacity, you know, everywhere so that, well, it's not face masks tomorrow, it's something else, but we could make them locally and have that uh, uh, independence, if you will, from supply chains and other things that really, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I've seen a few commercial companies. There was a London-based one, uh, de open desk that was trying to, um, you know, furniture-based things where, where like they would find the local maker for these things. I, I just think they were hard to get the consumers in, you know, um, uh, the demand isn't there for the product, even though the capacity and the production is there. Um, it's it's kind of along the lines of how could you recreate IKEA, <laughs> you know, where the designs are, are are the IKEA part, but the fabrication is localized. Um, we just haven't seen a lot of that in my uh, in my view, other than that, the, those COVID examples. Um, but I um, I, I you know, agree. That's, I that's totally agree challenge. with the with the um, open desk model. Actually, I'm looking for something similar to that because that's what in what we believe. We believe in 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 openness, and we believe in sustainability, commercial sustainability of the development of the of the project too. So as the capacity is already there, I just need to know if if you knew of some platform the this this <coughs> distributed manufacturing um, European project DDMP distributed. Uh, design marketplace but it's not actually what we would expect operationally in which we we have the the the, the, the building capacity the fabrication capacity virtualized globally over the the the, the fab labs and, and and maker spaces if i could I come maybe, in yeah. come in for a right. moment on that as well sorry did you want to go first you go first okay no. thanks um 
So, yeah, thanks for the question, Fernando. I think it's um, it's quite a chicken and egg problem. I think there's a lot of different pieces that have to be in place to make the whole system work. And it's quite hard to get investments in one piece without being able to prove the, the other pieces. Um, but just a couple of things I want to mention about it. Um, so, in fact, under the, the MAKE project um, that um, I mentioned at the start of this, and I'll put the address in the chat again afterwards, we are doing some development of infrastructures for distributed manufacturing um, and to try and start tackling some parts of this um, challenge. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. I see you've uh, put the, the link in there. Um, in particular, we're looking at um, distributed contracting systems. So, you know, one of the ways to tackle the challenge around um, getting the buyers is to work in the early days with some of the large buyers, um, which can be things like governments, NGOs, um, companies. But then you need to be able to make it look relatively seamless from their point of view. Um, and easy to contract with multiple small producers because that's not what they're used to dealing with. Um, so there's work going on around that side of things. Um, also on um, like data protocols for the mapping of manufacturing capacity so that we can create systems that will you know, let you see where you can get things made. Um, yep, there's, so there's um, experiments going on like that. I also wanted to mention that Gosh, um, the gathering for open science hardware. Um, I know. I'm a member of. Are you great? Okay, so I know there's been some conversations in Gosh about setting up a common uh, platform for open science hardware um, products. So yeah, that's that's another thought. So yeah, I mean, to me, this is a key part of the ecosystem that we want to build, and it's um, it's a question of how to you know, what order to get the pieces in place um, so that we can make the case for the investment that's needed in the rest of it. Um, Karim, did you want to come in? What I wanted to add is that uh, those plat the platforms come and go and there are lots of projects. We are also part of at the DDMP project in here in, in Europe and we were part of a project called Open Next, where we try to do op open source hardware uh, with, with uh, SMEs together. And while these, while it, while it works in these pilots, uh, I also have yet to see anything on a bigger scale uh, to, to really work. And, and the only thing I also, what they, what, is what Dale mentioned when, when, the, when they all were printing those face shields, uh, because they're probably the, the, the people needed this and the, the thing was also easy enough so everyone could do it. Um, so probably this is still a, a long way to, to go until we reach this distributed factory. Having said that, what I think at the moment would work and is not yet really done, I think enough. Uh, we tried, this, tried it out some, sometimes with these open source projects project is to make a workshop out of it um, and to to use the makerspaces then as a way to get people in the makerspace and maybe even together with the designer of the of the of this thing do it together because then you're much closer to what the makerspace is able to do because most makerspaces are not set up as a factory i mean they can try to do it but they will half of the parts will not work and it, like like, yeah, it's, it's not so easy to make a factory, but, but they can do workshops. They can work with people. People might be interested to pay a little bit more, not go to Ikea, but to build something themselves. Um, so I see this really as a win-win-win situation because uh, you can get open source designs to people. People come to the makerspace uh, and everyone could, could kind of benefit from that. And I think this is a really good model for open source designs and makerspaces kind of distributed factory in this kind of way. And I, I, I think this could be done on a bigger scale. That sounds to me rather like the model that I believe open source ecology moved to, which was kind of charging participants to come on a course and learn how to do, how to build the thing, um, which I think works well for them. So yeah, definitely. Can work in some contexts. 
And, and also I have to, to say already that I'm sorry, uh, I mentioned it to, to you. you did. In the beginning, I have to leave a little bit earlier, so I, I will probably be away in a few minutes. It was really nice to, to talk to you. And um, you probably have my contact data somehow. If, if, you, if you have some more questions, just, just write me an email um, and, and we can talk about it. So Thank you I'm so just, much, Karim. Just Thank leave. you. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for your contributions to the conversation. Much appreciated. So um, I think we don't have very long left in this um, anyway, but um, are there any other um, questions, uh, experiences, contributions that people would like to make? I also need to be keeping um, an eye on the our oh, messages are all thanking Kareem, I think. Much appreciation there um, for your participation. Thank you so much. So unless there are any additional questions, I think we'll um, leave it there. I'd like to, to thank um, Dale as well as Kareem. Um, both um, your, your contributions have been very helpful indeed. Um, very insightful to learn from you. And uh, just to repeat that we will be having another one of these discussions on the third Wednesday of May, and that's going to be on the topic of edutainment. Um, so thinking about things like uh, events to put together kits, um, how we can bring in people um, who are not necessarily normally coming into maker spaces and um, how we can use that also as a revenue model. So. I'll leave it there for today, but thank you again, Dale, for, um, for joining us and for sharing your experience. And thank you all of you um, for participating in this conversation. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.